Okay, so we are being recorded. Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, we're going to have just a quick business meeting before we um, start the, um, the general educational portion. I just had uh, some really exciting news about the photography show that I wanted to share with everybody. Um, we have the largest show that we've ever had. We have 189 images. Um, wow. Just by comparison, last year we had 147, and that was big. Um, but this is huge for us. Um, we've never come close to almost 200 images, which is really nice. And another bonus is we have, I don't know the number, I think there's six people who are brand new who have never um, submitted before, two of whom, um, actually three of whom became members. Um, so there might even be seven people that have never exhibited before. Um, just as a, just for an idea that in the beginners section, we have um, eight people showing. Last year, we had seven. In the novice, we have 10 people showing. Last year, we had six. In intermediate, we have seven. Last year, we had six. In advanced, we have seven. Last year, we had six. And in masters, we have seven. And last year, we had five. Um, so it's a combination of people moving up or people moving into the community like Carl, who came in at, a, at the master <laughs> level, um, and uh, Bob Udine. Um, no, Larry Udine, um, who came in at the master level. These are people that are extre extremely experienced or pro actually professional photographers. Um, so it's really cool. And I'm, I haven't seen the images and has everything. Um, I'll tell you just since we're talking about it, where we are at as far as what's going on. All the images came into Anne. She had to spend an enormous, incalculable number of hours uh, helping people resize their images. Mostly, this was a problem for people who shot with their phones, who are either shooting at a very, very low resolution or zooming in to take a picture. And when you zoom in to take a picture, the, uh, the, the number of pixels is really small. Anyhow, this and, is something- Adrian, can I jump in and yes. just say that Anne was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Absolutely. She was, on the, she, we were uh, emailing back and forth probably for an hour and she was absolutely terrific. Yeah, she's been um, so patient with everybody. You know, we have these pe some people that have never done anything like this before um, and they were completely lost and she just, you know, nursed them through the whole process. And in doing so, learned a lot about what we need to teach our members. So we'll be addressing that. Ann and I will be um, planning to address that for the membership so that people will know for next time or, actually know so that they have some quality images. For years, I have been really um, upset about the general condition of photography for the world because people are shooting images to show on their computers or to email to other people. And the images are crap. And they're losing birthdays. And they're losing um, events that all of us have photographs of and these people will not have photographs because the images are such poor quality and that's always been concerning I don't want that to happen to our club um, it's not for championship images it's for the images in your life that you want to make sure you have for later on um, so we'll be um, planning something in the in the near future um, you know just a brief zoom kind of thing to talk to people about that issue um, anyhow so what's happening now is is Anne is preparing all the images um, so that they're ready to go to the drug judges. Um, we've never done this before. So um, we're using Dropbox so we can send them in a high quality way. Um, all right, here's Susan. And so, so that's what she's doing now. Then she and I are gonna look at all the images together just to make sure they show up on my screen the same way they showed up on hers as if I was the judge. Um, Paul Hirschman has been really helpful. He prepared all the spreadsheets. And then we will be sending on Friday, the 26th, we send everything to the judges. And at the same time, we will be putting all the images on the Valencia Falls website in the galleries so that people can vote for people's choice. Um, none of the images will have people's names on them. Um, we have ballots prepared that the people can use either by downloading them or I'll put them outside my door. And if they don't have a way to print or download or they're confused, they can just come and pick up um, a ballot and then they can return it via email 
um, by scanning it or photographing it or however they get it back to me or by leaving it outside my door in a box. So we'll, we will be doing the people's choice in the same time frame as we're doing the regular judging. So that will be from the 26th to, I didn't write it down. It's like, um, oh, the, the March 5th. So the, from the 26th to the 5th, all the judging happens and the information comes back to me and then I'll tally them and we'll do the regular uh, um, honors and awards and uh, best in show for those divisions and all that stuff will get out to the community the same way that it always gets out to the community. Um, after that, I will put the names of the, of the human beings, the, the photographer's names on all the images in front of their titles like we do for the slideshow. Um, and then we will put up uh, final galleries so that the whole show will be online on the Valencia Falls website with little ribbons pasted on the pictures as if it was hanging in the show. Um, so it's going to be cool, and I think people will enjoy it. Um, and then, actually, and then Marty, once we're done, uh, Marty will be giving the actual ribbons to the humans that won the awards. So they'll get a really hard copy of a, a real ribbon um, for whatever images won things. Um, yeah, and yeah, so that's where we are. I just wondered who the judges were this year. Same. We did not change that. Um, you know, it's very hard to get judges. And although I would love to change, especially one of them, I like to do it. I'd like to do it when we can actually see how they judge. This year, we have no opportunity to see how they judge. You know, they're not walking around with somebody there. So we're going to just leave it with the three. We know we had a, a little bit of a problem with one of them last year. But since there's three, it averages out fine. So it's Kerry, who's been with us for years and years and years, Irene Hill, and Art Silverglade. Um, and, you know, I think it'll who, be- fun. Who is Carrie, please? Carrie is um, for a member of the Coral Springs Camera Club. He's been a judge down there. Um, very, very experienced photographer that I knew. I'm, I uh, designed and sold wheelchairs for profoundly disabled people. And I worked with him. Um, and then just serendipitously, he turned out to be a photographer. <laughs> Um, a very high quality photographer. Anyhow, and he's been judging our show for years. Okay. Um, he's probably our, uh, he and Irene, and then Irene joined him. We've had- His, first, his first name is? His, his name is Carrie Britton, C-A-R-E-Y. I'm going to send everybody um, a little bio on all the judges. I, I do that okay. every year. So that will go out. When the, judge, when the, um, uh, when the photographs go to the judges, a, an information sheet will go to all our membership to, and to the other people that are in the show who are not members um, by email so that you see who the judges are. And then um, you can look them up if you're interested. Okay. All right. So somebody, oh, Miriam just joined and Vivian. Okay. So we're good. We only are missing two that didn't join. Okay. Just to go over the calendar for a little bit, um, all of these things that are relevant are on the community calendar as well. Um, I have about one, uh, probably 10 images for the reflections slideshow. And I'm going to send out a reminder on that. Um, you have till the 15th to submit to that. Um, and the next one is- I had a question on the reflections. Do the reflections have to be travel photographs? You mean as far as local? Yeah, you could shoot them in Delray Beach. <laughs> no, I mean, do they have to be like, can it be a reflection in a window? That's just yes. like a reflection? Okay. Yeah, I mean, we can't, you know, I don't have a lot of reflections from other countries. So whatever you have, it's still okay. fun. All over the world includes your house. Um, Okay, the next one is nature all over the world, which is March 1st, which should be very interesting. But that's our last topic that we had selected. So as soon as the, the, um, the period for submitting for February closes, which is on the 15th, probably the 17th, I'm gonna start circulating a list again so we can pick the next six topics. So I have the original list with the ones crossed off that we already uh, used, and then you can see what's uh, left on the list. Or if anybody thinks they have something they want me to add to the list, go ahead and send me an email so that I'll add it. And then we'll do the same thing we did the last two times. We'll send around a long list, call it down to, you know, maybe 15, and then send down a final list um, of those to get the things that we want. Um, and I don't want to do it more than six because I hope we don't need to keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I hope we can get back to doing the um, the ones in the cafe, which are so much more nice. Um, okay, so the the topics we 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 have topics all the way through April now. Um, so we're in March. We're going to be doing two educational programs. We have the smartphone um, educational program with uh, Todd Nettlehorst coming in to speak to us, and a review session for that. Um, and then, and also, I'm going to have Anne um, email Todd so he knows one of the what the issues were when we had these submissions from the from the smartphones, just so he can reference that when when he's teaching. Um, and then the second session in March is going to be small se small scenes, so that's um, going to be looking at the landscape and going down and delving into the small parts of the landscape. Um, and then the April one is going to be minimalism and negative space. Guys, are you still with that topic? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, and that's April 16th. So you have that all those dates on the agenda that I sent out to you. Um, okay, that's all I have. Um, does anybody else have any questions or issues before we start the educational portion? Uh, no, but okay. I, I would just like to say something uh, about Ann Digman for a second. Okay, okay go. Um, um, I just want uh, everyone in this photo, uh, this photo club to know that uh, she has been a tremendous help to me as a newcomer to the photo club. Uh, putting, you know, trying to help me uh, with my pictures that I have, that I plan, that I'm planning to exhibit. And uh, I know she has spent hours upon hours helping everyone. And uh, I think we should say hats off to Anne and, and thank you very much. I really appreciate all the work that she's done. I will let her know. Thank you, Anne, and all your work also for this club. Thank you. Welcome. And okay. Sam sending all those great little tidbits, Sam. <laughs> Sam's our resident uh, sharer. Right. Anybody else for the good of the group? Okay, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Doris. It's yours. Okay, thank you. Um, my core group consists of um, Marty, Roslyn, and Nancy, and we prepared a presentation for you on how to um, improve your black and white photography. So we're going to start with Roz, and we're going to be sharing the screen. Okay. You ready for me? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to put this up so people can follow along. Okay. Takes a minute. Okay, this is one of the handouts that everybody received. This was an article from a photography magazine. And what I did was I got rid of all the advertisements by putting it into a document. But um, if it says that, if you think it's our advice, we're, it's not. It's some professional photographer who wrote the article. Okay, go ahead, Roz. Okay, the, I mean, the first thing is subject matter. And when you consider, you have to consider your subject matter. Would it be strengthened by the absence of color? And I wanna add lib a little in here. I went back to a number of my pictures that I took before we got digital and, and I was shooting in black and white. And I saw some of them that I just can't imagine them in color. They were uh, either like a chiaroscuro or they, they just had so much texture to them. And, so, and if they were in color, I think we would have, some of them would have lost their, their drama. Um, and that's what you have to look for, you know, the, you know, not, but not every image will look better in black and white. Uh, sometimes color is needed to distinguish your subject from other elements in the image. And so you really need to evaluate whether or not your chosen image will benefit from black and white conversions. Uh, shape and form, when you shift an image to black and white, you can no longer rely on color to add interest or a focal point to your photograph. And that's why form and shape are incredibly, incredibly important in black and white photography. You'll have to look beyond colors and instead focus your attention on shapes and lines and arranging them in a way that emphasizes the most interesting aspect of the shape or that creates an intriguing composition of different shapes. Uh, and you can see in the picture the different shapes that, that, it, that it really concentrates on the shape of the building. 
three is pattern in color photos. Patterns often go unnoticed because the colors draw all the attention away from them. However, black and white photographs give you a much better chance of capturing interesting patterns um, with the distraction of color is no longer present, giving subtle patterns a chance to take shape and emerge. And you can see various patterns in this, um, uh, pic this picture that's showing up. And you can also see um, texture. Te texture is also a crucial element in black and white uh, imagery. Textures provide us with tonal contrast and relay depth to the viewer. Without textures, you would simply have a smooth flat surface showing some shade of gray. But with texture, we have something interesting and exciting, and exciting to view. Uh, try combining a variety of textures like a glossy pen next to a textured sheet of paper sitting on a dirty desk. The right textures combined together will have to add interest and appeal to your photograph. A, a strong composition is even more important in black and white photography than in color imagery. Remember composition elements such as the golden ratio and leading lines when composing your image. These elements help pull viewers in and keep their interest in the absence of color. If you notice in the picture um, how the, um, the buildings and the street lead your eye right to the center. Um, lighting is also very important. You know, as I say, lighting, 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 it's kind of like, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. This of course is of vital importance in black and white photography. In black and white photographs, proper lighting can make or break an image. Good lighting can help increase the contrast within your image, providing more interest to your portrait, or it can be used to create drama, mystery, and moody contrast within the image. Um, and when you shoot, you should slightly overexpose. <clears throat> um, this helps bring all the tones up a little so you don't, <clears throat> so you don't get, lose any details in the dark shadows. Of course, you don't want to overdo it and blow out your whites but a slightly overexposed image can be tweaked more easily to suit your needs. Um, avoid noise. Sometimes grain adds to an image, but always be in intentional about your use of it. Many people will shift a poorly created image to black and white to hide the noise in their image that results from poor setting choices. If you, intention you are intentionally shooting to create a black and white image, be very conscious of your settings and choose them wisely. <laughs> Most of the strongest and most well-known black and white images are crisp and sharp. So don't let your ISO get too high. And nine, shoot in color. Um, many cameras have the option to shoot in black and white. Maybe if you know you're going to be converting your image to black and white, always shoot them in color first. This is something that was new to me because I was up in our forest and I was shooting both the same picture in color and in black and white. Um, figuring that that would be the better way to do it. But according to this, it's, um, you know, it, it, she should shoot in color and then convert. And so when your camera internally converts your color image to black and white, all kinds of detail and information is lost in the conversion. Rather than risk a subpar creation, shoot your image in color and convert it to black and white on your computer where you have much more control of the finished product. And then number 10 is contrast. When converting your photograph to black and white, pump up your contrast. Whether you use an action level layer or curves in your conversion, your black and white photograph can handle a lot more contrast than a color photograph image. Make your blacks a deeper black, your whites a brighter white. You can always pull up the histogram on Photoshop to check your levels. And you'll want a healthy looking mountain in your histogram to have a strong image. Thank you very much, Ross. We're, we're going to have a short video a little bit later about how to convert from color to black and white uh, in Photoshop elements. Um, now we're going to have uh, about a six minute video from an expert photographer, and he's going to go over some of the advantages of uh, black and white photography. Wait a second. Uh, um, you want to click that? It's just quiet here. 
Black and white photography can be a great way to express how you feel about something that you're photographing. In the first two episodes of exploring black and white photography, we looked at using shadows and using texture. Today, it's about mood. If you have any comments or questions, you can address those down below. Now today, on exploring black and white photography, as I mentioned, we're going to be taking a look at mood and how to create mood in your black and white photography. Let's get started. This is what I love about black and white photography. You can take an image and create something completely different in mood, in the feel of it, just by changing it to black and white. Take a look. This is the original. And I, I really do like the original, you know, but it, it wasn't conveying what I wanted it to convey. What I wanted was it, it to frozen? feel it's kind sad. of cold Doris, it's you know, frozen. and frozen. stark. And I think that really does it. Look at the difference. Nothing wrong with this. But when I change it to black and white, boom, it just, it just yeah. feels Doris, he is him, but he's not and moving. Old and cold. Well, and I just love that feel, and I find that black and white photography there you go. Really brings there it go. out. Thanks. Look at this shot in the middle of a river in the fog. It's just stark. And that's one of the things you can really do with black and white photography is to create that stark feeling, that almost empty feeling. Um, why you'd want to do that, I don't know. It's just something that I kind of enjoy bringing out in some of my photography. It's a feel. Over here, same thing. Fog doesn't hurt uh, to create that stark, lonely feeling. But this in black and white is different. In color, nothing wrong with that. And if I was feeling a little bit differently, maybe I'd leave it like that. But just gives it something again the mood again nothing wrong with it in color in fact i really like this in color because of the the warm tone of the sand about this one for a different mood completely all right um, and I'm showing you these uh, often in, in the color version as well, because uh, often I will, I will, you know, I shoot most of my photography in color, actually. But sometimes when I'm looking for a different feel, I will definitely go uh, to, to, to black and white. Now, this one in color is an elderly gentleman sitting on a fall day. You can see the trees are starting to turn color here, sitting on a bench. And um, it's, it's pretty and it's really nice. But I wanted to try to convey something a little bit more, and I'm, I don't want to use the word ominous, but I do want to, I wanted to convey something like a weight on him. Maybe it's the weight of being a little bit older, um, or maybe the weight of a lifetime of experiences. But that's what I was trying to convey with this, and this photo in this particular version didn't do it for me. Uh, converted it to black and white, and I just, I really, I made everything dark in the back. I... Um, I used some masking. I used a blue filter. I just wanted to really put the highlight on him. He's the only thing that's really, really lit up and the bench. And I wanted to put some weight on his shoulders. And in black and white photography, one of the ways to do that is to just, is to go to black, is to go to very, very dark tones. And it kind of puts a weight on. At least that's the interpretation that I was going for. And speaking of, of, of age, how about the, how about aging? some of your photos just a little bit. And that's as simple as taking a subject like this, which is an old abandoned mill, and putting a warm tone on it, doing a little bit of light toning. In this case, I used a photo filter, but you can you know, use any type of toning you want. Um, this is the way it looked originally. This is the actual black and white image right now. And now you put a tone on it, you put some, a warm tone on it, and it's, it's almost like a sepia. You know, and you can add a sepia tone or any other kinds of toning, uh, you know, coffee filters, all sorts of different things. But it just really uh, takes something that's old and gives you that vintage 
feel. Same thing here. Now, I could have used this image in, uh, in a tutorial I did not too long ago on abandoned places and things, but I saved it for this because I wanted to show you. Now, this is a, uh, a shipwreck. It's a boat, and they're holding it onto, holding it up by these, these wires here. Otherwise, it would have gone right over. But now I've toned it, and I've used those warm tones again to try to give you a feeling of, of age and a vintage quality to it, a retro quality. But here, here it is without. This is just the, the black and white version of it. Nothing wrong with that. But when you add the toning, it just makes it, it just ages it. It makes it look aged. If I was, if I really wanted to work on this, I guess I could, you know, digitally put, you know, cracks in it and, uh, and, and make it look like it's a, it's a really old photo or something like that. But this is the, uh, this is the version that I wanted for this particular image. The other thing you can do with black and white photography to create mood is to define and simplify. Simplicity is a really key thing. Now I'm just going to take off the black and white layer here and show you what it was like in color. It was mostly black and white except for the green on this leaf here. To me, for me that was extraneous. It was just a distraction. Turn it to black and white and all you've got is you've got your shape, you've got your tones, and you are concentrating mostly on the water drops. And that's what I wanted. And that's what black and white did for me on that particular image. Simplify, simplification. Same thing here. The dandelion. You know where it's at. If there, it's in a field and you can see it and it's very clear. But when you take away the color, now you're concentrating on the dandelion. How about defining the tree branches? And lastly, one thing I've, and I've talked to you about this before in other tutorials, do you really want to turn a flower into something that's black and white and take away the beautiful color? In this case, a close-up of an iris, the color version. But when you change this one to black and white, it's like it almost speaks to you. Once you get started on black and white photography, you're hooked. It's a great way to express yourself in this fantastic medium. Until next time, I'm Ray Scott reminding you it's not what you see, it's how you see it. And I'll see you soon. Okay, um, now Marty is going to go over uh, some tips for um, improving your uh, smartphone photography. The article was written for iPhones, but it's applicable to uh, Androids as well. And some of the tips are applicable for uh, using your camera as well as the phone. So hope you enjoy it. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I downloaded the, uh, I printed this article. It's like almost 40 pages, but I summarized it to try hopefully to make it simple. There are only eight tips, but I hope they're uh, helpful. Number one is plan what you want to shoot. Just don't go shooting anything indiscriminately. Look at it, try and compose it. Use it, use number two, use backlighting for silhouettes if you want to enhance something and keep it simple and don't cram everything in because if you get too much in it's going to just make it unusable and tell to try and tell a story when you have people in the picture just don't Again, with an iPhone, usually if you hold the button down, just keep shooting. And number six, use a clear object in the foreground and another in the background to give depth. Slow down. What was that? Slow down, please. Oh, I'm sorry. He's on number six, but I'm still on number five.
You have things in your printouts and your hands. Just say everybody got the handouts, so shouldn't be a problem. I know. Do uh, you want me to slow down, or we're going to look at them mm -hmm. on your own? Doris, continue. Okay, uh, up to number seven. Shooting in a train station gives you shapes and shadows. Doris, <laughs> Doris, let them see Sorry. the images. Just let, okay. let them see the images. Otherwise, it's useless. All right. Here, we're up to train stations. So here's an image. You have, you know, different shapes, geometric, everything, you know, everything mixed in. And finally, uh, learn how to edit your photo, uh, pictures for better results. There are so many different programs available, we can't even go into describing half of them. Okay, we're almost done. Thank you, Marty. You're welcome. And, uh, said before, shoot in color, and then you can always convert to black and white. It makes it a lot easier. I'm just going to add something to this. I, I read this article last night, and um, this guy from the iPhone Photography School is a really good teacher. And I was very impressed by this article for what it adds for people that are using smartphones, but also general photography composition information. Um, and so I resent just this one article again last night. So if you can't find the original listing with all the articles and videos, this one is in a separate. Um, I thought it was that important. Doris? Yeah, I'm on. Back I'm going to gonna show you some of my photos. And Roz has a few of hers. And then we're going to have a short video on how to convert uh, in Photoshop elements from color to black and white. Um, this would have um, patterns, texture, and mood, repeating patterns. This photo was practically all black and white without any converting. There was a little color in the reflection of the keys, but it just looked much better in black and white than it did in color. Repeating patterns and mood. Definitely mood. The same picture and color was a bright, sunny, happy day and take away the color and you have some ominous looking skies maybe some ominous looking uh, stormy seas and the mood completely changed. Textures and patterns, definitely textures and patterns. Mood, that was all black and white. Roz, you wanna comment on a few of yours? Yeah, th this was up in our forest, and when it was all green, it was a very nice picture, but it became very dramatic when I changed it to black and white. Yeah. Now, this one, I think and the next... I have all those names. I'm sorry? Right. I didn't hear what... Right. I, think, I think people are having private conversations, so if you're going to have a conversation, please mute. Okay. Oh, it sure was. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I also took this one in, in color. So the next slide should be the one in color and you'll see the difference uh, in uh, this one. So you can see this one, it's kind of an okay picture. Can you go back? Uh, yes. Doris? And I think it becomes much more dramatic in black and white. Again, you know, I was using black and white on the, on the, um, the mushrooms on the trees. Okay, thank you, Rosalind. This is the uh, American Cemetery in, in Normandy, much more stark in black and white than in color. 
Uh, this was a pink flower and I played around with uh, Photoshop, made it a white flower and I managed to get the black background. And white tulips. And this definitely has more mood. It didn't have much in the way of color. It had a blue sky and blue ocean. And uh, the picture is much better in black and white. Okay, we're done with that one. We're going to have a short video about the conversion. And then we'll open up for discussion and questions. <clears throat> My name is Don. I own and operate Virtual 360 Images. The following videos are going to be on Adobe Print Shop Elements 11. This short video is going to cover in uh, Elements 11 how to convert a color picture to a black and white. Very simple. I've already opened a picture in Print Shop Elements 11. To start out, we're going to go over to where it says Enhance. Click once. You have a gray drop down about three-fourths the way down. It says Convert to Black and White. Click. It'll show us a before and after. If you look down in the lower part of the screen, there's some other options that you can click on that save some time, that changes the effects. As I change from one item to the next, look at the after picture. The newspaper view, portrait view, the landscape view, snapshot view, another landscape. Most of those will have just a little bit of a change on it. If those work for you, you're in good shape. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to click on OK. We can still touch this picture up a little bit. It does an excellent job of converting it. But If I go back up to Enhance, click in the drop down, it says Adjust Lighting. The box off to the side, come down to brightness and contrast. That'll let us lighten it up a little bit. A little more contrast to it. You can kind of adjust it around where you feel that it needs to be. I think that's probably good right there. Click on OK. And basically we're done. We've converted that picture to black and white. We have adjusted the color a little bit. And I think that's presentable at this point and uh, is probably ready to be saved, framed, and uh, hung on the wall. Remember, when you go up here to do a save as, when the save as box comes up, in this case, we didn't do any more than just change the color from uh, color to black and white, so it didn't ask us to do a uh, uh, what's called a PSD file. It's already defaulted to uh, JPEG. Click to save. I want to write over the one I have. And if you'll notice under the options of uh, Saving, I always set mine to the highest uh, quality, which is a 12 maximum, and click OK. And we're done. I hope you learned something from this. Uh, if you have any questions, let us know. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. My name is Don. I own and operate Virtual 360 Images. Okay. Um, did anybody have any questions or discussion? I know we gave you an opportunity to email Nancy in advance if you had anything you'd like to bring up. Nobody emailed me. <laughs>
<laughs> I have um, one thing, to, two things to say. First thing is I muted everybody while that was going on. So if you need to, t if you want to talk, just hit unmute. Um, I wanted to just say something about the very last video. Number one, it was from Photoshop Element 11 and I'm using, I think 14 or 15. It's exactly the same process. Um, and when he showed you the diff the box where you could click on infrared black and white versus uh, vivid black and white, next to that, there were sliders for different colors that can also be used to change the way the black and white looks. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because he didn't. Um, and the other thing I would say is that he did not say copy your image first. So always make a duplicate image and work on the duplicate so that the original is undisturbed. That way you won't be afraid that you're going to mess something up. Okay. Good That's advice. What mm -hmm. um, we're done, unless anybody oh. would like to discuss anything more. Yes, Miriam. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a cleaning lady. That's why I have a mask on. Um, I wanted to say, uh, right, agree with Adrian about you should make a copy of it. Always retain your original. Now, sometimes you want to make your black and white high key. So you might, instead of using brightness contrast, you might want to use levels. And with the levels, you can adjust the shadows, which would be... Uh, if you look at a histogram in, 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 in Photoshop Elements, the levels would be the blacks and, and the whites and the midtones. So depending which way you want to move, you get more contrast if you adjust the shadows and, and, and the highlights and the midtones can go either way. Now, also, I was, I, I rather do that than using brightness contrast you know, in general. And the picture he showed of the man in the woods with the, that he changed to black and white, you could still keep that in color and black and white. If you find that you like the trees better in color, but the man in black and white. Yeah, people need to know how to do that. Right, but there's, <laughs> the, we can do a lesson on that and yeah, how you yeah. keep some things in color and some things in black and white. And I did want to say also, um, I have a whole bunch of slides that I decided I convert because I somebody in my Thursday class was talking about converting slides. Um, they had a machine, but I don't have a machine, don't want to spend the money on a machine. And my scanner has a, uh, a, a gizmo to put on it that you can put four slides at a time. I found I had pictures from Florence, which were pink because of how long ago they were. Pink and magenta. I got really good black and whites out of them. And so this, this is gonna be fun then. I'm, you know, to get two pictures for the, um, for the review session, you're gonna send me the a color and the black and white so we can do a comparison. And this will be really good to go back into your archives for this. You don't have to go out and do a, a new photo shoot. You can go back in and look at images and try to build your judgment of what will make a good black and white. And you'll see, you'll try it and you'll see. Um, so I, I think that's gonna be a lot of fun, right? Well, Adrian, so it's gonna be a total of four pictures, correct? Just yes. double check. Okay. Yes, you're sending me four images, um, two and two, the black and white and the color. All right. And then I'll when we do the review, I'll put them both out on the screen. Um, and I I I'm considering doing a basic Photoshop elements class, for, especially for the people that have not really used any editing tools at all. Um, so I'm going to give that a little bit of thought because I realize that people don't even know how to bring their images in. And if you're shooting um, in if you're not shooting in RAW, and RAW is a way um, to get all, it's a setting that you get all of the information on all of the possible colors in your image. So you can edit it better. Um, in Photoshop Elements, there's a way to bring a regular JPEG into the editor in RAW. It's just a click. And that gives me a lot of different fine tuning that I can do, even though it's just a JPEG. Um, and so with your smartphone images, you can do that and you can increase the blacks and you can increase the whites. And so your, your um, conversion to black and white is more under your control. Um, so that's just something to know about that if you want to fool, if you have Photoshop elements, it's a good thing to fool around with. Okay. Maybe Any you can shoot in RAW on an iPhone? 
if you have some, I, I yeah. well, no. What I'm saying is, if yes, you're you shooting, if you're shooting in regular iPhone and you're not, you don't have any of the special apps that allow you to do any of those fancy things. When you bring your iPhone image into your computer, which you can do by sending it to yourself as an email, or I do it as an AirDrop, because with the Mac system, I can drop a picture from my iPad or my iPhone directly into my computer and not lose any resolution by something called AirDrop. Um, it goes into my computer, and then I can use any of my editing software to work on it. So what I'm saying is that you've, you've put this JPEG into your computer. You now go to Photoshop Elements, you go to File, and where you click on File, it says Open in RAW. And then you click on that and you get a completely different palette of editing tools to work with, which is a lot of fun. Okay. Okay, great. I want to thank uh, Roz, Marty, and Nancy. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation and that we all learned something new from it. And Doris, we want to thank you because you really did most of the work. <laughs> <laughs> not so, not so. Um, everybody researched the articles, and um, I tried to pick the best ones. So. And they were excellent. They were Thank really you. excellent. Thank I'm you. Glad. I'm uh, glad. Thank uh, you. And not, next one, it's Barbara Schwartz and Susan Van Ness will be um, teaching us next month. And right? hopefully one day we're going to put Nancy back to work finding a restaurant for us. Right. <laughs> Wouldn't that, <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Can I add one more thing? Go ahead, yeah. Miriam. Um, there's an app for an iPhone called Photo Transfer mm -hmm. App. So you use the Wi-Fi on your computer, um, I believe. And the app, you have to have it, you have to have it on your phone, the app, and the desktop version of it on the PC, so that you with Wi-Fi, when you run the software, you can either through the phone or through the or through through the desktop on your computer, you could transfer files to and from your phone to the computer okay. and vice versa. And Great. what is it called? Photo Say transfer again. app. Photo transfer. That's exactly what AirDrop is. So yes. what that is, right. is that if you're not using a Mac, if you're using a PC, that mm -hmm. you can do it that way. Yeah. It's called photo transfer app. Yeah. I, I'm looking at it right now. That's great to know. Sa and, it's Sam and, and there are apps that you can shoot in raw on your iPhone. You can, if you want. It'll do, it'll do that for you. Sam? Okay. Let me add something that requires no, you not to any new software, which is all of us have for the iPhone of that matter, and maybe for the, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, <laughs> Android. Uh, a, char a charger. And the charger has a cable that one end is connecting to the phone, and the other one is connecting via a USB con connector to the charger. The same cable can be connected to your USB port on your computer. Once you do that with the scanning of the computer content that on Windows is a browser, a window browser, you can discover the telephone and then you can browse through the images and copy them to your computer. So you don't need any fancy tools or any uh, duplicate software as long as you connect via a cable. So I will add to that, that in the summer when I'm at camp, that's the only way that I can do it because I do not have Wi-Fi. I that's only have a computer and it's a PC and I have my iPhone. And so I do it via cable, but I do find two problems. Sometimes it doesn't work perfectly, but the other problem is that the, uh, the um, icons that I'm looking at of the photo images are really tiny. So it's a little mm -hmm. bit more difficult than when I do airdrop, but it works. When I, I, when I, that's all I do. When, when I, when I put, uh, um, connected my iPhone to my uh, PC with, with the, um, the USB cord and I went in, I could find my phone, but none of the pictures came up. Do you have, it's, it comes up differently. It's, I don't know what I'm up. Where I'm, do you I'm, find I'm, it? I'm, it comes up. I can't remember the initials. I'll DC, look and I'll, it's DCIM, is what. Yeah, it and then that's the as. same. That's the same as an Android. The only problem I have, I don't have a problem. I can enlarge mine. I think the only problem I have is it's my problem. Is I very rarely get rid of. I don't get rid of enough pictures on my phone 
So when you go to your PC or your computer, you have every single picture on your phone is going to be downloaded. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Unless you have a PCIM and got nothing. Select the map. But you can, you can select what you want to download. Yeah, yeah I yeah, know. But I'm saying is it still comes up. Every single yeah. picture comes up yeah. and then you can just select it. Rosalind, yeah, but, I'll tell you that I have that problem all the time. And sometimes I have to do go with back and forth and back and forth two or three times until the image is actually shown. And make sure okay. your phone is, if you if you have your phone locked, make sure your phone no, is no, not it's locked. locked. Yeah, yeah. It's not, okay. it's not, it's it's not easy. I, I'm very interested in Miriam's, um, because if Miriam's method is as simple as doing airdrop, you actually look at the pictures on your phone. You select just the ones you want. And then you hit airdrop, which in this case would be transfer or whatever that app is. And they just go over to your download folder and right. they're yeah. there and you just pull them out. I'll, ha I'll have to look. I bet you there's something on for Androids also. I haven't yeah. looked for it. So you have to have airdrop on your PC as well? No, airdrop is the one that Mac uses. I'm saying that Miriam's oh, one, one that says transfer photos. Miriam, okay. could you? So airdrop will only go to a Mac. Correct. Um, okay. It's only I Mac think product. Photo transfer app will work with, with, with uh, Macs also. You can go on their website and, and just see if, if it'll work with a Mac. I'm 90% sure that it'll work with a Mac. I mean, you know, the apps are so inexpensive for five dollars. It's certainly worth it to see if it works. If it works in a Wi-Fi, because well, I've taken pictures that I didn't shoot with the phone, like when we went to the railroad museum in Miami, and I wanted them on my phone to show people, and lo and behold, they're still there. Oh, on interesting. The phone. So you did it the other way. That's very. I went interesting. the other way. Yeah. So I went that's the other way. That that's a good one. Okay. All right. Anybody so, uh, else have a question yes, or a comment? I do. Who's, who's that? Oh, Susan, go. Yeah. Um, you know, in the video where they changed the black and white tone to a, a little bit of sepia, um, how would you do that? It's, uh, oh, um, you use a photo filter from the, there's drop downs in, you know, when you're editing the photo in elements, there's yes. drop downs for photo filters, like with oranges, or blues or reds, and you apply like an orange one. And they're and different Picasso. shades of orange. Well, that'll be good to try. In Picasso, it's just an option. Right. So. Um, of course, if you have the Nick filter, Nick Silver effects, you could find that in there too. Um, there are sepia ones in the list. But the easiest way is if you, if you, you know, like when you need to make an adjustment layer in Photoshop Elements, there's a bunch of them. One of them is photo filter. And, and, and you have different, different colors that you can apply to it, uh, okay? And you can adjust the opacity if it's too much. That's good to or know. The, sat the, the, the oranges come in different saturations, so you could decide uh, how, how brownish, brownish, blackish, whatever you want it to be, um, and adjust the opacity and or the fill. I'm and, sure and if, you, if you Google um, uh, convert uh, image, use Photoshop elements to convert image to sepia, you'll get all the instructions you need. I never did that with Photoshop elements, but I'm sure what Miriam yeah, says. Just it in Photoshop CC also. Just to let you know, I, I'm assuming I'm not the only one that has an Android. I use Dr. Google, my favorite doctor. Right. And I went to about guide to transfer photos from Android to PC without a U USB. And they have a download search even more and Google Play directly. So I'm assuming it's the same thing. I mean, I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can right. all Google. But yeah. so, yeah. I mean, Dr. Google is yeah. wonderful. I use Dr. Google all the time. <laughs> 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 I Every think question. In, um, excuse me, in Picasso and also maybe in Photoshop Elements, they show you a choice of which effect you want in your black and white. And some of them might be lending towards sepia. Well, um, in, um, in Picasso, sepia is an option. It's black and an white option. and sepia. Okay, good. good. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Okay, thank you. I tried to pay attention to the hands this time, but on your, on your icon that I'm looking at, I can't always see the hand. Like Miriam's hand is buried in the sky. So I'm oh, trying to I look got over. The wrong, I got the wrong theme. Today. Yes, I'm trying to look in the list, but it's hard, um, but whatever. 
Thank you all. And thank you all thank who submitted you. to the photography show when I sent out my begging letter because I was getting very nervous that we had so few and now we have so many. It's wonderful. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Remember thank two, you. Im two, right. Im two images, February 20th is the deadline. I'll send out a reminder. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.